before we start, I just want to pray over this passage. Uh, you can't have enough prayer, so uh, pray with me. God, I just want to um, thank you for the opportunity uh, to look into your word, uh, to know what you know, and to see what you see, God. Uh, these are your words, and I ask that tonight that what we hear would be your words, Lord, that anything I'd say that is not of you, that it would be ignored or not heard. And I ask that everything that is of you, Lord, that it would be taken to heart and that we can see how we should live according to your word. And I pray this in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ, amen. So I kind of have just one very simple question that has kind of, I think, spurred me on into journeying into this text. And if you guys have your Bibles, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 6. Um, the main question that I had, there's a verse in 1 Corinthians 1.18. It says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. And that verse, I, whenever I think of 1 Corinthians, that's the verse that just comes to mind. And it's kind of the thesis statement. It's kind of what's going to bring up what in this passage is about. But the question I have is, the word, the word of the cross is the gospel. It's the message of the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that we should be saved by grace through faith. And Paul here is contrasting two different wisdoms or two different understandings of the gospel. One sees it as foolishness, and the other sees it as the power of God to save souls. And my question is, why do some people see the cross as foolish, while others see the cross as something glorious? Have you ever thought that before? Why, why is there such a division among seeing it? We both see the gospel, we both understand the concept of the gospel, but why do two people react so differently to it? So the first point is understanding the wisdom of God. Let's read verses 6 through 8. Paul says, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And so before this, Paul was talking about the two different wisdoms, those who see the gospel as foolishness, and those who see it as something that is glorious. And the question is, what, what is Paul meaning by these two different understandings? Because it's important. It's not just about what you know about the gospel, but it's also about how you know the gospel. And so he brings up this contrast. And so the first, we're going to see those who do understand the gospel and those who don't understand the gospel and the differences between those two. So the first one is those who don't understand it. He says... Although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. Furthermore, in verse 8, he says, None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Um, so he, what he's specifically talking about in this context are the Pharisees, the scribes, the, re the, religious, ugh, the religious rulers uh, of the day who believed that a simple knowledge of the Ten Commandments, the ceremonial laws, could save them. They thought just knowing what was right and what was wrong could save them. And they thought, because of this, they didn't think that Jesus Christ was necessary. Jesus Christ came and said, I come to bring life. You guys need me. I am going to be crucified on the cross for your sins to pay the debt to justify you before God because you can't do what's right. But according to the Pharisees, they thought that they knew what was right and wrong, and according to their human ability and wisdom, they can be saved. So what I mean by, what do I mean by understand? I think we need to kind of dig into this. Uh, in the Greek, the word means a deep personal understanding. So it's kind of the difference. You ever heard of that old saying, uh, you may know about God, but you may not know God? You ever heard of that one before? Like I said, it's not about what you know. It's also about how you know it. So I'm going to pick on Caleb right here because he's right here. But I know Caleb, okay? I don't just know about him. And what I mean when I know him, I know his desires, what he likes, his dreams, his hopes, everything, right? We have this friendship. That's the difference between a friendship and acquaintance, somebody who truly knows that person at a deeper level. Paul also is referring it to as something to receive, to accept, or to believe. It's not just a logical understanding like 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's a logical understanding. But he's talking about it's how one accepts it or receives this understanding, how they believe it. And that is what Paul is referring to here. And so those who cannot are the rulers of this age. And they're characterized by an excessive desire for human glory found in human ability. Knowledge, rationalism, education. They had an educational knowledge of the word of God and the laws, but it didn't 
It wasn't affecting their heart. They didn't see Jesus Christ as valuable. They didn't treasure him. They didn't see the need for him because they thought, well, we know the law. All we need to know is know generally what is right and wrong and we'll be okay. That we can just fulfill it. We can do this or that. But they didn't understand that they needed Jesus Christ. And so they understand Jesus to be worthless. They don't see it. Why do, I, why do I need Jesus? According to their worldly wisdom, they didn't need him. And this is what Jesus says to them in John 5, chapter 5, verses 42 through 44. He says to the Pharisees, But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe, receive or understand, when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? They thought they had the answers to the big questions. What is the purpose of life? What, what is right? What is wrong? How can I save myself? How can I have eternal life was what they thought they knew. And Jesus is saying, you did not understand. And of course you couldn't receive this new wisdom of the gospel of Jesus Christ because you were already full of this other wisdom that you prided yourselves on. Has anyone ever seen the movie 2012 or 2012? Yeah, okay. So there's nothing smart at all about that movie. I'm just going to be honest. I think it's ridiculous. I mean, it's sort of fun. Uh, but there is one scene that has some interesting insight that I think is a good illustration. Uh, there was a scene of two monks um, standing up in the Himalayans in this temple or something, and it's just seconds before like the big waves come and crash over the mountains and they all die. And so the two of them are sitting there, and the older monk's just very peaceful. He's just sitting there just, you know, in just an ambient mood, and, and the younger guy comes running up, and he's just like, we gotta go, like, the waves are coming, they're gonna crash on us, we, we had to get out of here, they got these big spaceships, like, from the Close Encounter, the third kind, we can jump on there, save ourselves, and, and the, the old guy's like, okay, calm down, calm down, let's just have a cup of tea, <laughs> and you're just like, this is so random, but <laughs> they sit down, he starts filling up this cup of tea, and he keeps filling it, he keeps filling it, he keeps filling it, and it's overflowing, the young man's like, okay, stop, stop, like, it's full, like, don't keep wasting the tea. And then the older monk says, well, you're like this cup of tea. You're full of conjectures, ideas, opinions, and your own wisdom. How can you receive new insider wisdom when you're full of it already? You can't receive the wisdom of God if you're full of worldly wisdom. They're two different worldviews, two different understandings that you, have to, that you have to understand. And just like that monk, he was so full of all his own ideas and opinions are you full of worldly wisdom? Are you full with the ideas that you think you have the answers to everything? And the big question, the question is like, what happens after death? What's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false? Can we simply gain it through human knowledge, logic? Or where can we find these answers? And that's what Paul talks about. Those who can understand the gospel then are those who are mature. He says here in verse 6, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom. Although it is not a wisdom of this age, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. And so mature, that's one of those tough words. I, when I was uh, reading through this passage, I was kind of like, what, what does he mean by mature? Like, does he mean like those who accept Jesus Christ, who are spiritually mature, get the wisdom? And then like, if you're just a baby Christian or just accepted Christ, you, get, you know, you don't get any of it. You know, I mean, so does that mean like, like I would say Nathaniel is more spiritually mature. He has been in more of a leadership position than I have longer and he's older than me, so he's had a longer relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that mean that Nathaniel has access to the wisdom and I don't? Now, in this, uh, in this context, Paul is talking about the spiritually mature, those who have been saved by grace. Um, the Greek word uh, refers to perfect or complete, um, those who have been perfected in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Um, if you go back, uh, last year we talked through Romans and preached on that, and that is a really good place to go back to kind of understand the whole process of justification and such. And so that is what Paul is referring to. He also said that this wisdom is hidden or secret, meaning it's not something that you can just gain through science, the scientific method, logic, rationalism, education, however you want to call it. You can't gain it through just a simple conceptual understanding. So why do the mature, the ones who have experienced the grace of Christ, understand while others don't? Um, I was kind of thinking about the best way to explain this because it is, it's a little difficult to, to fully grasp. But think of, um, have, you, have any of you ever lost a loved one before? Yes, I'm sure most of all of you have. Um, so my, my grandmother, I never met her. Um, 
My mom was pregnant with me when she passed away. She was hit head on uh, by a driver who was um, high on drugs and she instantly died in the car crash. <clears throat> that was a sudden, unexpected death and it was very tragic for my mom. It took a long time for her to get over it. Um, but she, later on in life, she met a woman who had the exact same thing happen to her. Her mother had died in a car crash by someone who was drunk driving. My mom could truly relate and understand what the woman was going through because she had experienced it herself, right? You know those people who come up and you explain like a difficulty you're going through and they're like, oh yeah, I totally, I totally understand. And you're like, no, you don't because you haven't been through it. You have to experience it to understand it. And that's kind of how the gospel of Jesus Christ is. That's what this wisdom. The mature understand it. They understand how the gospel of Christ is magnificent and glorious because it has changed their life. They have been saved by it, by that grace. Like I said, it's not about necessarily what you know, but how you know it, right? People can know that my grandmother uh, passed away in a terrible car accident, but unless their grandmother went through the same thing or their mother, they can't fully grasp or understand it or experience it. And so Paul is talking about something that is deeper. This understanding is a valuing, a treasuring, an accepting and receiving, a deep personal understanding. So that brings us to the second question, the source of the wisdom of God, verses 9 through 16. Starting in verse 9, But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. Let's go ahead and stop there for now. But how does one understand the wisdom of God and how does one not understand the wisdom of God? What's the source of this wisdom? If it can't be found through logic, human reasoning, education, what is it found in? And Paul says, well, it is, it is, first off, it's not man-made. It's been decreed before the ages of our, for our glory. That was in verse 7. And he talks about how no eye has seen, no heart of man has imagined, no ear heard. Nobody has come up with this knowledge. No man. You think about the great philosophers who have spent their life trying to develop a worldview. They ask all the big questions. Like, it's amazing. Like, if you take time, you study, like, Immanuel Kant or Friedrich Nietzsche or all those different people, they create these systems to try to understand reality and the world. But they don't, you, you can only reason so much. You can't discover by human logic what really happens after death. You can't really know uh, what the future holds. You really can't understand what's right or wrong, true or false, just according to human logic. You need something. You need divine revelation, right? It is revealed by the word of God, inspired and brought about by the spirit of God. It has been revealed in this word by the spirit of God. As he says, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. I think this is a really beautiful picture of uh, the Trinity. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So in this, in this context, Paul is referring to the Spirit who searches the depths of God, um, what God desires, what God sees, how God sees, um, what does he not like, what does he dislike or like these things that make up God, his disposition and the affections of his heart. Because God is a being. He's not an impersonal, impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force. And this is what has been given to us. And Paul kind of explains it. He's like, it's kind of like the spirit inside of a man. For who knows a person's thoughts, right, except the spirit of that person which is in him. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. So let's pick on, I'm sorry, I'm picking on people all night tonight. So Chris, I'm going to pick on you. Let's imagine that Chris has a spirit, right? And the spirit refers to the seat of emotions, will, desires, affections, and dispositions towards something or someone. Okay? Imagine if we can know the thoughts of Chris. Okay? I mean, it might be scary. I don't know. <laughs> but imagine if we knew his thoughts. Like, and not just like a whiteboard of quotes that went in like Chris's head, but his experience of life, his perception of life how he sees things, how he sees what's right and wrong, true or false, what he likes, dislikes, his disposition towards everything and anything. Imagine if we could have that. That would be extremely complex and deep, right? That's what the Spirit of God is in God, the affections, the dispositions. Imagine if we can see as God sees. 
where we can learn to desire as God desires. Because he is the creator of reality. Like, have you thought about the fact that he has created reality? I mean, that's mind-blowing when you think about it. I always kind of thought, this is kind of a silly illustration, but if I was to tell you, imagine if your nose was on top of your head. <laughs> that's kind of weird, right? You think it's weird, right? Well, that's the way God made it. But it could have been another reality where the head, your nose was on top of your head, and you would have thought it really weird if I said, imagine if your nose was in the middle of your face, and you'd be like, what? <laughs> like, that's, no, that's wrong. Like, what's your problem? The nose always goes on the head, Nick. <laughs> Do you know who decided that? That was God. That's the gravity of the reality, the way we think. Third dimensional. I mean, you guys are engineers. You guys know the complexities of human creation and, and everything. Like, it's, it's impressive. It's very, very impressive what God has done. And so imagine, I mean, wouldn't it be great if he's the, he's the objective reality. He sees things as things are. He knows reality. I think it would be awesome if we could have access to that. I mean, I don't know where we could find that or, or if we ever will. But, um, but if we go to verse 12, he says, Now we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Guys, we have it. We can know what God knows. We can see as God sees. We can desire as God desires. That's what Paul says, when you be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may interpret and discern what is the good, perfect, acceptable will of God. We can know what is right and wrong. We can know what is true and false because the Spirit of God has been revealed to those willing to accept it and receive it. I mean, that's, that's quite amazing, and it's, it's freely given to us through his word. Have you ever thought about that, that the word of God is not just, it's not just a concept. It's not just a simple knowledge of being. It's really getting to know a being, God himself. I think that's something that we, we lose sight of all too often. He says in this one, he makes a good point, very interesting. He says, and we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit. The words in his word right here. Let me part this in words. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. I like that word interpreting. I think it's fair to say that in this world there are what we call worldviews, right? Uh, what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false. And understand, we see the same thing. Like, if we're in this room, we see that there's lots of people in the room. We see that there's a projector. Uh, you know, Isaac's sitting over there. We see that. Sorry. I'm just picking on people tonight. But we see, we see it. We see the reality, we see the world, but we all see it, though, different ways. Remember, it's not just about what you see, it's also about how you see it. Think of a pair of glasses. A pair of glasses are much like a worldview. It's how you interpret or see reality. The Word of God and the Spirit of God living in us as Christians who have accepted the gospel can see reality as it really is. We begin to desire what God desires, hate what God hates, see what God sees. It's what it means to become Christ-like. It's more than just simply simply doing things. You're becoming like Christ in what you desire, in what you don't like or do like. It's a profound sense, and it's also learning to value and treasure what God treasures, which is his son, Jesus Christ. That's the difference between a knowledge and wisdom that is made up of the world and by human ability and logic, and that that is made up by the Spirit of God who has created everything we see and know. The one who actually created human logic in the first place. So if this be the case, if this be the source that we find the wisdom of God, and if we understand the wisdom of God, how then should we live out this wisdom? Paul wants to bring, brings it back to a contrast between the natural person and the spiritual person. Verses 14 through 16. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So he contrasts. It's kind of right back to square one. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Once again, that contrast is brought in between the natural person, 
who simply abides by human logic and what he can see through his own wisdom and then the wisdom of God and someone who has been reborn and can see the value and treasure that Jesus is. The first one does not value, first off, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, the spiritual person does. The spiritual person sees reality as it really is because he has the spirit of God. He has the person who created objective reality, created everything, is now living in him. And so he can see things. He can interpret. He can judge, as Paul says. What he means by judge is means interprets, or he can know what's right and wrong, true and false, by the word of God and the spirit living in him. The natural person can't, though because he has considered it foolish. He doesn't think that the source of wisdom and knowledge is found in God's word. It's kind of like, who, who would you trust? So let's pretend there's some per- people with a prescription, the prescription for the condition of the human soul, which we're sinful, we need help, and they have the right prescriptions, and then you have someone who's blind, who, who can barely see. And you hold up, you know, fingers, and you're like, how many fingers do I have? And they're like, and the guy with the glasses can see. And he's like, Oh, that's, that's two. And the other person's like, I, three? I mean, who are you going to trust, the one with the right prescription or the one with no glasses at all? I mean, I hope you would trust the person with the glasses. <clears throat> and that's kind of a lot about how the spiritual person is able to see. It's not by his ability, but by the power of God. That's why Paul says, I don't come in words of eloquence and wisdom. In the beginning of chapter 2, he says, I come simply to let you know about Christ and him crucified. Because it's the message that makes the difference, not my human ability to speak. The, the words I speak now don't have any weight because of the way I'm saying them. They have weight because of what they truly are and what it can do for people. So, once again, why do people see this so differently? Well, <clears throat> I kind of have a, a story to tell you, but um, I'm going to pick on Zach and I was actually planning on picking him tonight. Um, but contrary to popular belief, Zach actually likes to fix things. And so <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. Um, talk about, you know, some new knowledge. But he likes to fix things, and he specifically likes to fix antiques, fix them up, and then he resells them at a flea market. And so this one, uh, last week in Labor Day weekend, we started building a pallet entry table, and we got into, like, this really exciting... Like, wow, like, we just built, I mean, it was the Mona Lisa of pallet furniture. <laughs> like, it's impressive. You can ask Mo, because she's seen it, and we built it for her, so she, she thinks it's awesome, too. So <laughs> we were super proud. We were really excited. And so we're like, you know, we're going to go to the antique shop, and because we just feel like in a mood to go check out um, other lame excuses of pallet furniture. <laughs> I don't know. At least that's why I went. <laughs> but we went to uh, do little at the antique shop. It looks like a Western setting. Um, it's also very pricey, sorry. But if you go there, you should go, it's awesome. But me and Zach go around, and we're looking around, and Zach likes to do this thing where you guess the price of the antiques. And so he's like, how much does this cost? And I'm just like, I don't know, 90. And he gets it right every single time. And so, I mean, his knowledge of antiques is amazing. Me and Mo are like looking at this lamp, and we're like, oh, look at the marble. And he's like, that's a 1976 World Fair lamp. <laughs> I'm just like, how do you know that? It's impressive. <laughs> so like... It, it's quite an experience walking through an antique shop with that guy. Um, we eventually come to this spice cabinet, and uh, I never knew what a spice cabinet was until that day because I saw it. And, <laughs> like, it's an old one, and so it has, like, you know, oregano, thyme, and different uh, drawers to put the spices in. <laughs> right? Am I getting this wrong? <laughs> thyme? Thyme. Thyme, okay. Sorry, guys. I'm from the East Coast. you got to forgive me. <laughs> so, so we're looking at this spice cabinet. It looks like an old desk, honestly. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful piece of furniture. It, it looks cool. And Zach, I look over at Zach, and Zach has this smirk on his face, like just this grin. I'm just like, he's going to ask me how much it is, but I feel like I don't know something. And so he's just like, so um, how much do you think that spice cabinet is? And I was like, oh, I'm going to give it a solid 300 He's like, it's over twelve hundred. I'm just like, oh, I totally got him on this one. And so he pulls the price tag. It's twelve ninety five. I'm just like, <laughs> like, oh my goodness, are you are you kidding me? We both saw the spice cabinet. It was right there. Both saw it. Looked the same to us. I mean, we both see the same thing. One of us valued it very low. The other one valued it very high. 
but it didn't change the value of the spice cabinet. Some people will look at the gospel of Jesus Christ and see it's foolish, stupid, unnecessary, and worthless. Others will see it as something that is wonderful and glorious. But it doesn't change the reality that the gospel is the revealed word of God. It is what it is. If only we could see things as God sees them, perhaps we would know how we should live. A lot of you guys are trying to live your lives according to a set of belief system or ideas. And even if you have accepted Jesus Christ, you still are in the process of trying to get back to reality the way God sees them. You see, when you have the prescription of the gospel over your eyes, you can see things much more clearly. For instance, if we're going to talk about mere application, I think it's important to recognize the Pharisees thought it was all about knowing and just doing. But it's also about how you do things and how you see things. That's the true application. A lot of us are just wanting to go like, well, what do I just need to do? But it's about how you see things. It's going to affect how you live. For instance, worldly wisdom would say that money is simply a measurement of success. If you make them out this much, then you are successful. But with godly wisdom, money is a tool for loving others. Marriage is less about a transaction. That's what the world says. It's less about trying to get something out of someone or trying to be compatible enough to where you can both be happy. No, it's about commitment, as Christ was committed to his church. That's going to change how you are in marriage with the money. It's going to change how you deal with money. Friendships, according to worldly wisdom, is about popularity and being the best you can be and about people recognizing who you are. But according to godly wisdom, it's about brotherhood, sisterhood, and unity, working together to a single unified mission. Life is less of an amusement park for some of you guys. It's not about just getting all the fun you can out of it. According to worldly wisdom, it's also a business ladder. You climb up and climb up and climb up, and that's it. It's also not a pessimistic outlook, in the sense everything is just done for. There's no purpose to anything. When we look through the word of God and we see things as God sees them, it changes everything. So take mind to what you, what you see as the gospel. Is it valuable? Is it treasurable? When I read this passage, I, I recognize how much I don't value the word of God enough. I'm like, wow, I should, I should really be in the word more. If I can know what God knows and see as God sees, desire as God desires, that's amazing. I mean, we think about the, like, how could you know a person's thoughts, right? Like, I can't know Simeon's thoughts. I can't know Eric's thoughts. I can't be in their head, but I have access to God's pure, good mind, and he wants me to become like him in every aspect. So the question is, do you understand the gospel? Do you get it? Do you see it? Have you experienced the grace of Christ to know enough that there is value? And it's not just about what you know. It's about how you know it. I can speak from experience. Uh, My father was a deacon and a teacher. He did Bible studies. He'd come and he bought... um, these commentaries, highlighted it, researched it, researched it, taught and taught. He even taught me about the gospel and how to live according to God's word. But he never experienced it until three years ago. He knew all about the Bible. I've known people who know all about the Bible, but they never let it penetrate them. They never saw the value of it. And it's, it's sad it's, it's wasted potential. I pray and hope that you can see the value of God's word tonight. And if you do and you have accepted Jesus Christ, that you would continue to turn to God's word as the ultimate source of wisdom and knowledge. That we would be able to see things as God sees and that it would direct our lives and how we should live. Do you get God? Do you truly understand him? Let's pray. 
God, I want to thank you for your word and taking the time to help us see through your divine revelation. You want us to see as you see, Lord, to desire as you desire. I ask this, that for all the students and including myself and the staff, that we would be able to more and more become Christ-like, not in just what we do, but also, Lord, in how we do things and how we see things, that it would affect our lives um, in a deeper way. Lord, I pray this all in your precious Son's name, Jesus Christ, amen.